Hello, I'm Enid Weixelbaum, a member of the League of Women Voters Rochester. I would like to welcome all of you here tonight, the candidates, the audience, and those viewing at a later date. All of you listening to this forum um, are welcome. This forum is sponsored by the League of Women Voters Rochester. We'd also like to thank our generous partners of tonight's forum, the Rochester Post Bulletin, the Rochester Chamber of Commerce, and the Rochester Public Library for your help. Due to the current pandemic, we are limiting attendees to the candidates and necessary volunteers. Guidelines for social distancing and the wearing of masks are also being followed. The League of Women Voters is a volunteer organization organized at the local, state, and national level to encourage citizens to participate in government. While we as a league do study and take stands on issues, we never endorse or support political parties or candidates. The views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates, not those of the League of Women Voters Rochester, or any partner or sponsor of this forum, and the sponsorship of the forum is not an endorsement of any candidate. It is our purpose in sponsoring this forum to provide you with an opportunity to hear candidates discuss face-to-face -face issues that are important to all of you. Tonight's questions have come from the League of Women Voters Rochester, the Rochester Post Bulletin, the Chamber of Commerce, and members of the public. If you would like to submit questions for a future forum, visit our Facebook page, League of Women Voters Rochester, Minnesota, for information. Uh, make sure you do that within the deadline for submission, which you will find on the Facebook page. As there's never enough time to cover all the issues in a limited time and setting such as this, Feel free to contact the candidates' campaign headquarters directly if your questions are not addressed tonight. We'd like to thank all the candidates for running for office, for offering to serve your community, and for the enormous time, dedication, and commitment that running and serving demand. We encourage our members as individuals, as we encourage each of you, to get involved in the community and the political party of your choice. Welcome to tonight's forum, which features candidates from Minnesota House District 26A. Candidates for this seat are Tina Liebling and Gary Moline. All, all candidates were invited to participate and, um, and um, are here tonight. Each candidate will have two minutes to offer an opening statement. The candidates will then respond in turn to questions provided by the League of Women Voters Rochester this evening's partners and members of the public. These questions were submitted in advance. Candidates will have 75 seconds to answer each question. The candidates then will have two minutes each to make a closing statement. I would like to suggest to candidates that to make your answer as succinct as possible. It isn't necessary to use the entire time uh, for your answer, but please finish the sentence that you're on when your time is up. We would like to cover as many questions as possible. Each candidate also has some 30-second rebuttal cards. These can be used at any point after each candidate has answered a question. Only one rebuttal card may be used per question, and please put the card in the basket after you have used it. The, time keep, the timekeeper tonight is League of Women Voters Rochester member uh, Julie Gilkinson. Questions from the public or check to ensure the follow, they follow our guidelines by League of Women Voters Rochester members Maggie Brimajon, Jane Callahan, Deb Duffy Smet, and Kathy Swessel. Asking questions uh, will be Matt. Uh, Matt Stoley had a brain stop there. Matt Stoley from the Post Bulletin and Brent Ackerman from the Chamber of Commerce. Sorry. Um, candidate Liebling will begin with her opening statement. You may, you may begin. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much to the hosts and to all of the folks who are tuning in and tuning in uh, later on as well. So I am Tina Liebling. My background is that I am an attorney. I um, was a criminal defense lawyer here in town and did a lot of public defender work. 
And that's because I've always had an interest in justice and making sure that ordinary people get a fair shake in our society. I also have a background in public health, which has turned out to be extraordinarily helpful right now during the pandemic. So I um, am the incumbent in the seat. I'm a Democrat. And I, through most of my career in the Minnesota House of Representatives, I've worked on health and human services. And I am now the chair of the Health and Human Services Finance Division, which puts together the Health and Human Services budget for the state for the House of Representatives. And because of that role, I've been working very closely with the Department of Health and the Department of Human Services and also with Governor Walz during this pandemic. So it's been a very busy, very intense time. Um, and uh, we are in a just uncharted territory right now with the worldwide pandemic. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. But I have always throughout my career maintained certain values. One is that everyone should have necessary health care when they need it without going broke. And um, that we all do better when we really all do better. That we that everyone should have the basics of life. And during the pandemic, we've seen that more than ever. Everyone needs to be able to stay home when they're sick. And we don't have that now, unfortunately. So I look forward to taking the questions and we'll ask for your vote at the end of the forum. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening and thank you all for being a part of this and for the organization that put it together. And all the questions that we're gonna get will be responded to quickly and on time, because I want to value your time tonight. Uh, my name is Gary Moline, a candidate for House 26A in the city of Rochester, Minnesota to represent us up at the state legislature. I've been a Rochester resident for 55 years. I spent 44 years in business, managing money, managing accounts, having employees up to 25 at some times. And I learned a long time ago that if you don't know what true budgets are, you're gonna overspend and then you're gonna tax the city or the state or the county you come from. We need to know what the tro true numbers are. And I thank you for the time, I'm ready to listen. Thank you candidates. Uh, we'll begin with questions from the League of Women Voters, and we're going to begin with, with candidate Meline. Um, this question comes from the League of Women Voters. Uh, what measures would you support to improve and secure elections and voting in Minnesota? Well, I barely can hear what you're saying because your mask is muffling it, and you aren't holding your phone close enough to your lips. Let me repeat So please the repeat it. I will repeat the question. What measures would you support to improve and secure elections and voting in Minnesota? The voting in person or a seal absentee ballot. Thank you. Candidate Liebling, same question. So just let me start out by saying that Minnesota has a very safe and secure voting system. And um, we, are, we really lead the nation in turnout and people should have absolutely no fear of voting absentee this year. In fact, online you can check to make sure that your ballot has been received and, and that there are no uh, problems with it. So um, I'm looking forward to a huge turnout this year. I think it's a great thing. There have been proposals over the years that um, would make elections a little bit easier to manage. We should have a true early voting system, not one where you just vote absentee in person. Um, it could, really could be done safely and securely. And I think we will be moving in the direction after the pandemic. I think people are gonna find that voting is really very convenient to do by mail and that we can do that safely and securely and really help people vote because it is there their absolute right to be able to cast a ballot if they're an eligible voter. And we should do everything we can to facilitate that for everyone. Thank you. Our next question from the League of Women Voters. We're going to begin with candidate Liebling. The multiple mass shootings in our country have led to calls for families to be able to report when a person is on the verge of committing violence with the gun. Do you support the so-called red flag laws. So I absolutely do support red flag laws. I voted for um, those bills when they've come before the legislature. 
And um, they have been um, implemented in other states. And you know, they don't solve the whole problem of gun violence for sure. And I understand why some people feel nervous about them. But um, these are done in a, have been done very well and responsibly in other states. And I think that we could do that here because you know, a lot of the um, gun violence is actually even people committing suicide with guns. And if a family member can get those guns out of a person's hands, you know, um, and there's just a little pause, that person's life might be very well be saved. So um, it is really important. I also support universal background checks. I think this is just an absolute no-brainer. We should be doing it. And we can, we can attack this problem and, and make progress on it. Thank you. Candidate Moline. Well, the thing is, it's not about emotions or feelings. It's about facts. And the facts are that if you care for somebody in your own home, you will already be aware of what's going on. And if you need help, why are we afraid to keep the police and the sheriff department part of our life today? We don't want to defund the police or the sheriff's department or the fire department. We want to defend them. Because when we need help, who are we going to call? The number is 911. We need to give help to those that are needing help with somebody to arrive on time and if you don't respect who they are and defund them they will not be there to defend you thank you uh a rebuttal yeah so i just want to say i don't support defunding police and uh, i think most democrats actually don't support that and uh, i think in here in rochester we have a, we're fortunate to have a very good police force but the red flag laws are a tool, and the police agencies actually support red flag laws, and they feel it will help them, give them a tool that they can use in these really tough situations where somebody who's dangerous has a lot of guns in their home, and they need to take a break from, from having that available to them. Thank you. We will move on to questions from the Rochester Post Bulletin, and we will begin with candidate Maleen. Uh, yes, I'd like to ask you a question on your stance on Medicare for all. Um, uh, so about 243,000 people, a quarter of a million people, lack health insurance according to a U.S. Census report in 2018. Um, yet we also hear that uh, if government on health care or universal health care pays only a fraction of what private pay does. And it's not an abstract question because Rochester is home to Mayo Clinic. And critics argue that Mayo uh, would be damaged if we did have some sort of a universal program. I'd like to hear your stance on Medicare for All and why you do or don't support the concept. Well, the word care, C-A-R-E, must be shown by who we care for. If we want some government entity to show care, we're in trouble. We, as a community and the county and the state, must be compassionate. Because if we don't know what compassion is, we don't care for anybody. So if we're going to think that there's some universal way to give us health care, medications, all the other things that we keep to keep us alive today, we're in deep trouble. Start caring for everybody that you know through your family, through your neighborhood association, through the church that you're a part of. Growing up, my mom was always a part of Women for Care. Thank you. Candidate Liebling. Well, I think that the pandemic has shown us again how broken the system is of a private insurance and especially that people have insurance linked to their employer because they lose their job, they lose their insurance and suddenly uh, in a pandemic they have no coverage. So I do support Medicare for all or you know, however you want to say it. I don't think Minnesota is in a position right now to go right to that. But to the question about prices, you know, um, the, how it works is open to being worked on. So there is nothing that says that if you had a system of Medicare for all or where everyone is covered, that the prices that are paid to different institutions are going to all be the same. So Mayo Clinic is a teaching institution. It does a ton of research. 
And that has to be compensated. So I don't think it's inconsistent to say Medicare for all and a wonderful institution like Mayo Clinic being able to survive and thrive. Um, but I absolutely believe that everyone needs insurance and the pandemic has shown us if somebody else is sick, it's pretty likely that I could get sick too. We're really all in this together and we need to make sure everyone is, is taken care of. Thank you. We'll take another question from the Rochester Post Bulletin. We'll begin with candidate Liebling. So Minnesota continues to have a persistent uh, uh, gap between white and minority students in terms of performance and graduation rates. Uh, earlier this year, a Minnesota Supreme Court justice, a retired one, and a Federal Reserve Bank president proposed a constitutional amendment to guarantee all children the right to a quality education. And of course, Minnesota, the gap is worse than many other states. I was just wondering, what are your ideas to propose and support uh, and to address this issue and, and, and improve also education for all students? Well, unfortunately, in the pandemic, with the uh, distance learning and the way things have gone, I think we're going backwards. And, and that is a really a sad thing. I've talked to a lot of parents who are really struggling to try to educate their kids at home. And those are the parents who can be home with their students. So we're, we're in a deep uh, problem. Um, education is not my prime expertise, but I would say that the whole problem of racial inequity has so much risen to the top. Um, there is such a greater awareness now about how, how systemic racism really is in, uh, present in so many different places. And I think when we talk about education for students, we can't separate that from the other kinds of, uh, of uh, situations throughout society. So for example, we have a problem with dis disparate um, suspensions for students who have acted out in school. And it's because I think that there is some tendency to view the behavior of black children differently than the behavior of other children. This is not gonna be solved easily, but we, we need to be very intentional about how we address these problems. Candidate Having grown up in western Minnesota, my grandpa and grandma came from Sweden. And my grandmother always said to me, you must be respectful and you must call people by the name that they are. We're all Americans. Why would we want to separate anybody because of one color or another? We're all important. And God has told me in my lifetime, listen to those that talk about respect for others. If you don't care for anybody, you don't care for yourself. So let's care more instead of caring less. Homeschooling, uh, other schools that are open, why are we afraid? Just because we cover it up and say we got a pandemic going on, we got to quit letting that take us over and fear, let's have the word hope. Thank you. Our next question will come from the Chamber of Commerce and we're going to begin with Candidate Liebling. As you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has severely impacted local small businesses across the state, including here in the Rochester area. What additional measures can and should the state take to help these businesses stabilize their operations and recover? So um, the legislature actually has done um, a number of things already beyond the federal help that came for businesses, which I understand really was not distributed in a way that helped um, a lot of the smaller businesses. But um, the legislature came forward with some additional small business help uh, loans. Um, there's been, I think, a lot of attempt by DEED, the Department of Economic Development, to, um, to assist businesses just um, in terms of information. But one thing we must do is get through the pandemic. And that means if we can all adhere to the guidelines, we will then be able to function in a much more free way. And there's just no getting around that our economic situation is because we're in a pandemic. We see states that have just had no restrictions. Now they're South Dakota, North Dakota, their cases are just off the charts now, going in the wrong direction. So. 
I think that by encouraging everyone with the same message, wear masks, keep distance, wash your hands, and all these basic things, that we can help our businesses stay open. And at the end of the day, that's what they want to do, is do business. Thank you. Candidate Moline? Well, I'd like the question repeated, please. As you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has severely impacted local small businesses across the state, including here in this area. What additional measures can and should the state take to help these businesses stabilize their operations and to recover? I think we learned back in 1974 about the Johnson Amendment. We shut down the pulpits of the churches that could show care. Every one of us has a need for some kind of care. If we're just relying on the government for care, we don't even know what the cost is. Do you know what the cost is every time you get some money from the government? It's called debt. And every time you get money from the government, it goes into your debt and it comes out of your back pocket. Whether it's in a fold or a bill fold or a checkbook or a credit card, it all comes out of your pocket. And then you've got to work harder to repay it because all debt puts you in bondage. We've got to know what the true numbers are before we vote for anything that is what they call taking care of everything for all. Thank you. Our next question comes from the Chamber of Commerce. Again, we're going to begin with candidate Meline. Okay, so this year was a bonding year and a deal has yet to be reached. What steps will you take as an elected official to promote the successful passage of future bonding measures to ensure that things like local transportation projects receive the funding that they need? The whole state needs support. If we look at a specific area, based on population, we're going to get a lot of votes to vote for that. We need something that serves the whole state of Minnesota, from border to border, from Wisconsin to Manitoba to North Dakota to South Dakota to Iowa. Everybody in this state is affected right now by the fact of lack of care for roads and the word respect. We've got to start learning what the word respects means. And how do you respect people? You know who they are. You're associated with them. They're your neighbor. You have to ask the questions, how can we help each other, rather than looking at that. Bonding puts us in bondage because all money comes out of the back pocket of those that are in business or those that are working. We gotta have a responsible bonding bill and people in government that are responsible and know what business is rather than taking money and don't know how much they care. Thank you, Candidate Liebling. Well, it's pretty clear we can't build our own roads and our own bridges, so we have to come together as a state to do that, and that's what state government does. Um, in fact, there is an agreement on a bonding bill. There was an agreement uh, between the House and the Senate, and the only holdup to that bonding bill is the Republicans in the House, because they and their leader decided that while the governor was exercising his emergency powers over the pandemic that they would not vote for a bonding bill. So it's not about the bill itself. There is an agreement. No bonding bill is perfect. It's an, it has to get a super majority of legislators, so it's always a big compromise. This one certainly is a big compromise. It has some really important projects for Rochester in it, and so I voted for it. I would vote, it for, it, vote for it again, even though it Again, it has things in it I don't like, but this is really important, especially now when, it, when the economy is down, this is the way state government can help to get jobs and inject money into the economy. And um, we, we know, and there are many important projects that are needed by our people and jobs that would be created both during the construction and afterwards. So um, I'm all for it. We need to get this going. Thank you, and we have a rebuttal. Well, do we know what the true cost of money is? If you sit in an office someplace in a remote location in St. Paul, Minnesota, and don't visit with people from outstate Minnesota, they tell me as part of the family, which was 153 relatives that live out in western Minnesota, wake up, quit spending my money before you take care of what the real needs are. I agree roads and bridges are 
really needed, but let's do it at a true cost. Thank you. Our next question is going to come from the public. Um, we're, I'm going to go with candidate Maline first. Should the state of Minnesota be doing more to protect the water quality in our lakes and rivers? Well, right now we had a, a group that gets together every Wednesday and we had a, an update on what's going on with Minnesota's water in the city of Minnesota, Rochester, Olmsted County. Olmsted County itself is in charge of all water, sewer, and anything else. We need to support those counties that take care of the water and care and have recycling plants and go inspect them and find out if they're doing what they say they do before they get any more financial support. You and I live in a community we're thankful that we've got clean water. I'm thankful that I have my own well at my house. If you don't know the true cost of what it is to have a well and water, go down to the city hall and ask those people in charge. The county is in charge of it. I ask that very question, what it would cost me to hook up to sewer and water. And the city would charge $10,000 per hookup. I said, what's the true cost? Well, they said, that's only the right to do it. You've got to go to the county and get permission. Oh, wonderful. Then what's it going to true cost going to be? For my property, it would cost me $80,000 to hook up the water and sewer. That's garbage. Thank you. Candidate Liebling? Well, when we talk about how to keep our water clean, it's one thing to clean it after the fact, but the real way to keep it clean is to keep it clean in the first instance. And in Minnesota, we have a serious problem with farm runoff. And I understand that farmers don't like to be told how to do their business. But the reality is that uh, Mr. Moline's well could very well be, be uh, polluted with nitrates from runoff from surrounding farms. And um, that is a serious health issue if it's present. We have karst geology, everybody knows, very porous ground, and pollutants run right through. So we all have to be responsible, even to the point of what we put on our lawns, as a matter of fact, and uh, try to cut down on the runoff that goes into our sewer system. So it starts there, because it's awfully expensive to clean it up on the back end. And the one thing that we know we all must have to live is water and land of 10,000 lakes, actually a lot more, and we want them to be clean. Thank you. Our next question from the public will begin with candidate Liebling. Do you think there needs to be more workforce housing? If so, what do you see as a solution to this problem? So housing is always a really difficult problem, and I know Rochester, it is one of the big issues here in town, especially, I guess, what we call workforce housing, which would be housing for people who are working but don't really earn enough to, to buy market-level housing, I guess we call it. So I think it's a multifactorial problem. One is we do need more housing stock, but we also need wages to be higher so that people can actually afford the housing that there is. This also goes back to the whole issue about health care. If people are paying, you know, if they have a health condition and they're paying many thousands of dollars for their pharmaceuticals or for their care, then their housing is not going to be affordable to them. So it is a multifactorial problem, but a serious one. I also think that we need to be looking more to employers who want to bring people in at lower wages and instead of just building for them, see how we can partner with them to build the housing that they need to be able to bring the employees that they need. Thank you. Candidate Moline. The word affordable housing is something that none of us can happen. Right now, the taxes in the city of Rochester have doubled in my lifetime three different times. There's an old saying, if you open up the door and there's a dog standing at the door and the name is tax, in will come tax. We had a briefing from the current mayor in the city of Rochester at our free speech group. And one of the positions that is taken is that we will tax you more. And I asked also the tax assessors, where do you get the word taxes from? Well, if you sell a piece of property and it's a 10,000 square foot or 4,000 square foot, if anybody in the community has 
a property of that size, you will be taxed accordingly. Oops, we shouldn't have said that because they're supposed to go inspect the property every other year before the taxes are raised. So again, if you don't know what the true cost of taxes are, nobody will have affordable housing because the city, the state, and the county, with the tax situation we're in, it'll all be gone. Thank you. Our next question from the, we'll take one more question from the public and then go back to our panel here. Um, Next question then from the public. Would, we're going to begin with candidate Maline. Would you be in favor of banning assault weapons? Well, depending upon what the definition of assault weapon is. To me, a BB gun to a bird is assault. To a, me, a pellet to a dog is assault. So I need a more clear definition. I understand what they're saying. Having many friends of my family have been in the military, I understand what an assault weapon is. But if you don't protect your property when somebody comes in to assault you, what are you supposed to do? Because we had a briefing from the fire and the police department in the city of Rochester right now. There's a four minute response time. If you've got somebody standing at the door ready to assault you, what are you supposed to do? Where are you gonna hide? Where are you gonna cover up? To me, Many times the laws are a cover-up. Take your masks off so we can see the true reason for what's going on. Thank you, candidate Liebling. So I, I think it would be a, a harder thing to do, but yes, I do think that we should ban assault weapons. And um, there is, I think there's a federal definition of what that is. Um, certainly people should be allowed to defend themselves, but you don't need an assault weapon to defend yourself. This is a weapon that's really used for mass killing. And I understand that some people like them recreationally, but you know, there are a lot of things we might all like, but that we're not going to say, oh great, you know, have it in society. We owe each other some responsibility. So yeah, I do think that we should get to that point. It probably needs to be done at the federal level, though, to really to be effective. But yes, I think we need to move in that direction. Thank you. We're going to go back to our panel now. I'll have a question from the League of Women, prepared by the League of Women Voters. And um, I'm going to begin with candidate Liebling. Uh, has Minnesota done too much, not enough, or the right amount to slow the spread of COVID-19 and why? Well, um, when you say Minnesota, I don't know if that means state government or Minnesotans generally. Um, I think that um, we are very fortunate that Governor Walls took this very seriously at the beginning. I think we're seeing the results of that, that we're a little better off than some of our neighbors. Um, at the beginning, nobody knew what we were dealing with, and I, I don't agree with every single thing he did, and I don't think even he agrees with every single thing he did, but I don't think it's too much. What I do think is a problem is that the wearing of masks and just following the, um, these rules has become so politicized that people, many people don't do it. So in that respect, I would say we're really not doing enough because we're starting to see spread in places and from activities that we just shouldn't be. And we still, even though deaths are down, fortunately, we know that the, this virus can have really far-reaching impacts on a person's health, even if you don't die. So we're still not out of the woods, and I think we need to really stay the course and watch the science as closely as we can. Thank you, candidate Maline. Well, if we use the word fear and keep a mask on, we're covering everything up. We cannot have association with people when we live in the word fear. We have more people that die from the flu. We have 21 million people in the United States of America that have died since the Roe v. Wade decision in 1973, called abortion, soon to be 22 million. Why don't we do something to protect the lives of the unborn? Why don't we do something to protect the lives of our kids and our kids' children and our grandparents and our great-grandparents? No, our focus is on control. 
I learned that the word respect is exactly what we're doing today. We're sitting six feet apart. Those that have asked for respect, you show them respect. But don't create chaos and fear all the time and use the word pandemic when the real thing that causes death is unforgotten. Thank you. We'll take a question from the Post Bulletin now. We'll begin with candidate Liebling. Where do you stand um, on the legalization of marijuana for recreational purposes? So I have a pretty well-known position in favor of personal use of cannabis by adults. I don't call it recreational because, you know, people use it for various reasons. Um, and I think calling it recreational somewhat minimizes it. But I think adults should have the right to use cannabis. It's a pretty safe drug, much safer than alcohol, actually. But we do need a careful system of regulation because I think it's very important that children not be using it. However, right now, children are using it. And people are using cannabis. It's just illegal, so there are problems with contamination and being uh, having to get cannabis illegally and all the things that go along with that, not to mention the racial disparities that it creates. So I think we can do, it's, it's not a matter of perfect versus terrible on either side. It's a matter of we can do better with a careful policy of legalization and regulation and allowing adults to make their own choices where it doesn't hurt anybody else. Thank you. Candidate Milleen? Why do you think the state of Minnesota has six adult and teen challenges located within the state of Minnesota? It starts out with a drug, whether it be a cigarette, whether it be cannabis, whatever else it is. I have a personal experience with that. Our son, who is now 53 years old, was hooked on what has started a just a methamphetamine, just a drug that was given to make you feel better which cannabis does. He was in bondage for 21 years. He finally quit. And through Adult and Teen Challenge, he is now set free and back working, building up money to buy, quote unquote, an affordable house in Stewartville, Minnesota, not Rochester. If you don't know the true cost, you don't have relationships with people, then you get drugged yourself. Wake up. It starts with one sip at a time, just like she mentioned about alcohol. It just starts with one shot at a time. Our son was ready to take a death shot 22 years ago, and he persisted that long. And then two years ago, he was going to use the last shot. Thank you. Uh, uh, now, a question from the Chamber of Commerce, please. And we're going to begin with... Candidate Malin. Minnesota has yet to conform to the federal tax code, which creates an undue burden on local citizens and on businesses. What steps will you take to help streamline our state tax system and ensure that it conforms with the federal code, including Section 179? Well, taxes are something that you get when you aren't even aware of it. Do you know when you walk into a restaurant or any place of business what the true cost is to have an employee because of taxes? With my 44 years of experience, I had up to 25 employees. I would pay somebody a wage. I had to generate two and a half times of what I paid them just to keep my door open. Small businesses are under attack. We forget that the small businesses employ the majority of the people. When you sit in an office in the county commissioner, the city hall, up at the state capitol, who pays your wages? How many people do you have employed by you that you and I that live here in a city or a county have to pay taxes because of overemployment with the government? We need to know the true cost so we can all stay in businesses and support the local businesses because having been a local businessman for 44 years, I understand the true cost and what taxes do to us. Thank you, candidate Liebling. 
So um, generally speaking, Minnesota has tried to conform to the federal tax code to, for the very reason that you mentioned, make it simpler for taxpayers. Um, and as we know that the federal government fairly recently did a big reform change, uh, which much of which I didn't agree with because it actually gave huge tax breaks to the very, very wealthiest and then puts Minnesota in the position of having to conform. So um, I'm uh, not up, completely up on all of this, but I think the real issue is that Minnesota will actually, it will cost Minnesota a lot of money. And right now, because of COVID, because of the downturn in the economy, we're really heading into a big budget deficit. Probably not the time we're gonna be able to conform to a federal tax change that's gonna end up costing the state lots and lots of money. So, um, you know, I understand it, it's, convenience is a really important thing for tax policy, and we wanna make it as easy as we can for taxpayers because, you know, <laughs> They're, they're doing the right thing by filing their taxes and paying their taxes, and we don't want to make it more difficult than possible. But, you know, I don't know if that's going to be really feasible in the short term. Right now in Rochester, Minnesota, we're affected by taxes. Go to the businesses in the community that have people come here from Iowa, Wisconsin, and South Dakota to buy products in Minnesota. They, on the border states, the businesses on the border states, you better get to know what they are and who they are and what's affecting all the small towns along the North Dakota, South Dakota border, the Iowa border, not so much Wisconsin border, because Wisconsin has more taxes than what we do. But be aware. Thank you. A question from the public. Um, we're going to begin with candidate Liebling. What do you think will be the most, or in your case, is the most challenging aspect of being a member of the legislature? Well, um, the most challenging aspect, I think right now, it's kind of the thing that most other people notice as well, and that is that everybody seems to have a different source of facts. It used to be that you could at least agree on what the facts were and then maybe have a difference of opinion and debate what we should do about those facts. Now people come in with their own facts from social media, from watching a news network that is pretty much fact-free, namely Fox, and um, just, uh, it's very hard to reach agreements. I'm very fortunate because my counterpart in the Senate is somebody who I work with very well, even though she's a Republican and we can debate, but we share facts. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case anymore for everybody. And um, I don't know how we overcome that, but it is becoming more challenging because you, you, can't, you can't reach agreement when people believe something that is fact-free. Candidate Maline. Well, everybody that's in office has a budget. How many people do you have on staff right now today in your office? How many people know? How many people know how many people that are in the office in the state of Minnesota have a staff? What is the cost of the staff? What's the ripple effect that comes to you and I taxpayers? They can sit in that office and be comfortable. And we don't have to worry about it because we let the staff take care of it. We don't have to answer any questions and be truthful and honest about it because we can defer it because we have an advisory staff. Having been on a city council race years ago, I learned what staff infection is. We've got to wake up and understand what true costs are. Each office should have a budget because they keep overspending and they have more so the taxes keep being raised up. Thank you. Um, a question that will come from uh, the League of Women Voters. And um, I will begin with candidate Moline and then we'll go on to the Postal and, and uh, Chamber of Commerce again. Um, this is uh, regarding our environment and climate change and issues like that. Should the legislature do more to prepare for and mitigate natural disasters like are occurring in other parts of the country? Living in California as I did for two years, 
they would not let us even trim trees. The ripple effect is taking place in California right now, Washington and Oregon. Guess who is in charge of those states? They wouldn't let us cut down trees. They wouldn't let us keep the grove clean. We couldn't even pick up the waste out of the yard. We could pick up the stuff we mowed because we were responsible for it. If we don't wake up and start taking over and possess the land that we were given and be responsible and respectable for it is, we've got people that want to work and help us take care of it. Even though we're not able to do it all, we better have a relationship with somebody as a neighbor. We care for our neighbors because they need help once in a while. And when we need help, they come and help us. You better get to know who your neighbors are in the community you live in. Having lived here, like I said, for 55 years, I know the true needs of the neighbors. They really need somebody that cares, is responsible, respectable, and knows the total cost of what money is so the taxes don't keep rising up. Candidate Liebling. So um, the question was about what, whether we need to do more about natural disasters. I will read, read okay. this. Should the legislature do more to prepare for and mitigate natural disasters like are occurring in other parts of the country? Well, of course, our natural disasters are a little bit different than what we're seeing out west, and God willing, they, we won't get what they've had just because of where we are in the continent. But um, we have begun to think about hardening our infrastructure for increased water events, for example. Rochester is very, very fortunate that the people in the 70s built the water, pro, um, the water system that we have here to protect us from flooding. But we can expect more and more floods. It sounds to me like Mr. Moline doesn't believe in climate change. I think climate change is very real. What we're seeing out west, the disasters, and I have a son in Portland who's breathing that bad air, or was, um, you know, this is really serious. We in Minnesota need to do our part to um, mitigate climate change generally. And yes, um, you know, we are, there is no red America and blue America. We are all in this together. And what's happening now with President Trump punishing blue states and, you know, that is just unacceptable. We have to be all in this together and we, because states cannot do it on their own. Thank you. Next question from the Rochester Post Bulletin. Uh, last summer, the legislature passed and Governor Wall signed a package of police reforms and included a ban on neck restraints like the one used on George Floyd before his death and warrior-style police training. It included new account accountability measures in, police, in the police arbitration process. Are you satisfied with the package, or do you think more should be done? Candidate Moline. Well, having a nephew that's in law enforcement out in West Central Minnesota, the word respect is gone. We've taken away the respect of law enforcement, the fire department, the police department, we have let riots come and burn down our cities. Do you know what the true cost of businesses are today? I don't think anybody really knows the true cost because what's happening is chaos. We don't have people in responsibility of the city, county, and state government. As was mentioned before by the woman on my right, it's President Trump's fault. Come on, let's get off that. Let's use the word respect and do what we're called to do. That's to care for one another, love one another, and be respectful for all people that live in our neighborhood and where we live today. Candidate Liebling. Well, respect is more than a word. And um, people who are black or other minorities have just as much right to be able to walk out their door and feel like they are respected and treated like everybody else and shouldn't be in fear. And what we found is that they often are. So the, the, to answer the question, the package of, of uh, accountability measures is a start, but in my mind does not go far enough. There are things we can build on, however. But there are some disappointments in there. Because of the Republicans in the Senate, we could not pass a measure that allows cities to require their officers to live in their own borders. 
why the heck wouldn't we allow Rochester to pass a rule that says you want to be a Rochester cop, you got to live here with the people you're policing? And yet, we weren't allowed to pass that. There are other measures we still need to pass. I think that when a police officer is accused of criminal behavior, that he, should, he or she should be prosecuted not by the local county attorney, but by the attorney general. So there's no conflict of interest, and we can all have confidence that the wheels of justice are turning as they should. So there's those I could talk a lot more about this, but no, I'm not satisfied. We need to do more. All right, we have a rebuttal. Well, again, I've got a relative that's a law enforcement officer. And when you put somebody in bondage, when you tell them that they have to do thus and so, and don't be controlled by what's going on. If you've got somebody pointing a gun in your face, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to run back and ask for more help? Or are you supposed to get a mental counselor come? I agree, we need more on the team to be a part of respect and discipline, but we must know what law and order is. It has nothing to do with Mexican, Hispanics, black, and air. It has to do with all of us. Thank you. We'll go to the Chamber of Commerce, and we will begin with candidate Liebling. The pandemic has led to millions of Americans losing their jobs across the country, including many in our region. What steps can the state take to promote job creation and put thousands of Minnesotans back to work? Well, the first thing I would say is we need to pass that bonding bill. That is an immediate thing that we can do to start putting Minnesotans to work. The truth of the matter is that state government doesn't have a lot of tools. Um, and um, right now, we're kind of trying to keep the bottom from falling out. Things like um, some federal money that's been put toward rental assistance so that we don't have people losing their housing. Because once people are on the street, then we're in a world of hurt. So there's a, we're trying to kind of keep things on an even keel right now. Um, it's going to be very challenging and interesting to see after the pandemic, because I think the job market will have shifted a great deal. So there are things that we do that we need to continue job training, um, helping people, uh, you know, anything that we can do to facilitate matching employers with employees is a, a great thing. Um, and for sure helping people get the training they need and the education they need to be prepared for the new jobs that are going to be there. Candidate Maline. Minnesota has a website called Minnesota Dot. Rochester, Olmsted County, have you ever looked at the type of trucks they have when they go fix a bridge, when they go fix a street, when they go work in an alley? How many trucks, trailers, and people do they have? They have a man sitting in front of a truck, slow down, a man behind the truck, say stop, a man behind warning, yield ahead. If a private contractor would do something like that, he would never be in business. Because we keep funding the county, the city, and the state. They've got all brand new trucks. When I was in business, I looked at what we could afford. When we sent out to do a job, we sent out enough people to get the job done not enough to dwindle and sit in the cab and watch what's going on. I understand safety is important. We've got the bumpers that you can put back there. We can protect them. But if you want to get Minnesota back to work, quit relying on the city, the county, and the state to do the ridge, ridges and roads. Hire the private contractors, the one that pay taxes, the one that live in the area that know the roads and will be alert to do it, not on days off, but every day when the work is needed, they will get the job done. Okay, I think we will not have time for one more question. I think we'll go right on to closing statements. Remember candidates that you have <clears throat> two minutes to make a closing statement. And um, by the luck of the draw, candidate Liebling, um, no, sorry, candidate Moline will go first. No, you said I would go last. You went first in no. the opening statement. No, you were going to go first. On the All right, so I'll go first. Candidate, um, when you drew your numbers, candidate Liebling went first for opening statements. Candidate Moline went second. Therefore, candidate Moline will go first for closing statements, and candidate 
Liebling will go second. So candidate Maline. Well, good evening and thank you for being here, whether it's on screen, whether it's live, whether it's listening. You're going to read about this in different locations. The Chamber of Commerce is going to share with you. The Post Bulletin is going to share with you. The League of Women Voters are going to share with you. So I'm going to be a candidate for Minnesota House 26A. We have a team of us. When I grew up in school, we had to learn what A, B, C was. That's the lesson that we had to learn. And we had to learn to listen. A, for me, was about abortion and accountability. Do we know the true cost of life? B, what a budget is. Who sets the numbers? Are they real? Just like we've been talking about the cost to run a state about the cost to have a staff in your office up at the state of Minnesota Capitol. Are they real numbers? After years in business, it showed us that true numbers, where they really are, and we've got a team to take care of it. C, we've been talking about cost and care. We are a team because we're involved in this community. We're involved in the state of Minnesota, and we will show you what a team does. We will let you know who cares, and we're going to open up the books so you can really see what the cost is to have the office full of staff. we got to know the true cost. So, again, to ABC, if this makes common sense, part of the change that's left in your pocket when you spend all the money that they demand of you, I'd ask that you vote for Gary Moline for Minnesota House. I thank you for your time and your vote. Go to my website and see more of who we are as a team, GaryMaline.com. Thank you. And candidate Liebling. Well, thank you again to, to the hosts here and for the great questions that were asked. And uh, boy, I wish our problems were as easy as just getting rid of some staff. That sounds like a great, boy, that would be so nice if we could just do that and it would solve our problems. Unfortunately, you know, here we are in the middle of a pandemic, which is an international, worldwide pandemic, and um, we need to, we need to um, take extraordinary measures to make sure that people are safe and that we get through this as best we possibly can. I, I just want to respond to one thing my opponent said some time ago about the true cost of money in the bonding bill. just want to point out that the bonding bill right now because interest rates are so very low. <laughs> this is like the best possible time to pass a bonding bill. We shouldn't wait. We should take advantage of that. And this is how we can help our state. Um, I also forgot to mention at the beginning, um, how could I forget? I, my husband Mark and I have three children who grew up here in Rochester. We now have two grandchildren. They're in little, just two years and three and a half who live here in Rochester. And so we have a tremendous stake in this community, which we, of course, have had the entire many years that we've lived here. Um, and I think we're very fortunate in Rochester that we have a really good community. But that's not to say that we don't need to make it better, especially during the pandemic. It's really showing us the gaps that exist and, um, and how we really need to pay attention because unless we really make sure that every child has opportunity to get ahead and every person, every parent has the opportunity to get health care when they need it and to earn a living wage, we are not going to move forward as a community. I think Minnesotans really care about each other and um, this is the value that I bring to the House of Representatives and I ask for your vote um, between now and November 3rd. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to both of the candidates. I would like to thank each of you for participating in tonight's forum. Thank you for your service to the community and for your willingness to participate in the democratic process by running for office. I know it takes a lot of work. I'd like to remind all of you at home that the views expressed in the forum tonight are those of the candidates, not those of the League of Women Voters, Rochester, or any partner or sponsor of this pro forum. Thanks to our partners, Rochester Area Chamber of Commerce, the Rochester Post Bulletin, and the Rochester Public Library. Remember that Election Day is November 3rd and that early voting in Minnesota has begun. If you have voted by absentee ballot and would like to change your ballot based on what you learned tonight, visit 
mnvotes.org, mnvotes.org, for more information on that process. Please don't forget to vote. If you have a question about your polling place or you would like to see your sample ballot, vote 411.org. To see this forum again, access the forums from the Rochester Public Library website. And good night, everybody.